Howdy. We are using new technology in a new age these days as uh, shelter in place has us limited in terms of how we can reach out and connect. We'd love to do this live and in person, but luckily we have technology to enable us uh, to send this message out uh, broadly. So the format of today is I'm going to probably talk 15 minutes, give or take. I'm going to cover some pretty detailed economic data around specifically oil slash petroleum markets. I've got two key points I want to cover. One, what actually is demand today? There's been a lot of estimates out there. Uh, people, people talking about, you know, where we think demand might be given everything that's going on. Uh, I've run some models it, based on some, a different way of looking at demand than we normally do. Uh, so I, I, I've got some pretty specific ideas about what the low end of demand destruction is or what the high end of demand, actual demand might be. Secondly, the second thing I want to cover today is where we think uh, the market is projected to go from here. As we continue to shelter in place, we see economic erosion. What does that mean for oil demand going forward? And I've run some models on that as well to help inform the market, market participants, producers, consumers about what this will mean for the oil and gas industry over the next uh, potentially two years. If you have questions today, send them into the chat, the online discussion in the Zoom webinar. Those, after I get done doing my opening remarks, those questions will come to me on my phone and I'll answer them after my first 10 or 15 minutes. All right, to start off today, I'm gonna cover the, uh, I'm gonna, I'm at, and unlike normal, I, I usually use a very specific presentation today. I'm actually gonna use my model. I'm gonna use the, the Excel spreadsheet that I built to run all these numbers in. And I'm gonna start off by answering the question, well, what, what is demand level today? How much, how much oil is the world going through? Based on the model I've run, I think that the current demand is 86 million barrels per day. Uh, I think that the, that the world as of today, because yesterday, today is when the new Saudi production and Abu Dhabi UAE production is supposed to hit the market. I think that the world is producing around 104 million barrels per day, uh, which means that the market is 18 million barrels per day oversupplied or 21% oversupplied. What that means as we're beginning to talk about filling up global oil storage is that at these current levels and with a total remaining oil storage in the world of 1.3 billion or 1.3 yeah, 1.3 billion barrels of remaining storage, we're 72 days away from filling up the world's storage with oil if the oversupply remains at this number. So where did I come up with 86 million barrels per day of demand today? Well, most of the time when people model demand, what they do is they use models and they look at, they look at inventory. So how inventories are fluctuating around the world and then model those inventory changes against known economic indicators, things like uh, consumption of, of durable goods, things like that. Uh, normally what we don't use is numbers of miles driven because miles driven is a very seasonal thing and it's hard to predict in various regions what's happening to various economies, various seasons, weather patterns. It's hard to use miles driven. However, in this case, because of the global impact of shelter in place, miles driven, numbers of miles driven around the world actually becomes a, a fairly good indicator. Uh, the first thing that I wanna show you is how does this supply demand uh, disparity compare to historic levels? This graph shows you uh, the last 40 years of supply and demand of oil. Now, I am combining for the sake of discussion today, oil and petroleum products. In other words, I'm combining the entire supply chain into one discussion point. Normally we would say, Ryan, you can't do that. You have to treat downstream, midstream and upstream differently because you're talking about different seasonal demands, refinery runs, that sort of thing. Agreed. However, today, the end, the demand destruction we're talking about is at the end product. And so that demand destruction is backing up all the way through, through the supply chain, although we're feeling it upstream first because refiners have cut their runs faster than oil producers can cut their production. So for today, we're going to talk about overall demand and consumption or supply and consumption of end product of equivalent oil barrels. But if you look over the last 40 years, Supply and demand, production and consumption of oil products has really been within plus or minus 2%. In fact, if you look, if I were to show you a price chart 
where WTI prices were during this period of 40 years, what you'll find is that when oil prices are at their most extremes, it's only due to a one or 2% oversupply or undersupply of crude oil versus market demand. We'll take a look at where we are today. Up here, you'll see that we have a total of 21% demand or, or supply and demand disparity. The market is 21% oversupply. That is almost 10 times the amount we've seen in the last 40 years. And if I went all the way back to 1950, which would add another 30 years to this graph, you'd see that the most it was ever oversupplied or undersupplied was during 1974, 75, during the Middle East oil embargo. There were some months in there where it got up to close to 6%. But once again, that was due to an abnormal or an unnatural market condition of the Middle East producing and storing a lot of oil. So the U.S. had to, had to react with West Texas Intermediate and U.S. production skyrocketing. So 21% oversupply today is by far the biggest amount we've seen in history. Well, back to Ryan, where did you come up with this 86 million barrel a day total amount or the demand destruction of 16 million barrels, 15 million barrels a day off of normal consumption? Where did you come up with this number? Well, we look at three prime or two primary sources or consumption areas of fuel. One, jet fuel. Two, fuel that is used for individual transportation. Mostly cars, light transport, individual drivers. One of the assumptions in my model is that if you look at things like heavy hauling freight, that in general, those levels have stayed constant. Well, yes, there's some, some heavy hauling, some diesel consumption that's not being used, things like school buses, it's being replaced with added amount of freight on the road to transport goods because people aren't driving their cars as much. So we assume that freight and heavy hauling stays relatively constant, which is probably conservative. And instead we look at exclusively jet fuel and individual transportation. Let's start with the simple one, which is jet fuel. Uh, Let's start at the levels of these, of these fuels. How do we know how much diesel, how much uh, oil production that went to gasoline, diesel, and how much went to jet fuel that, uh, that's going on in the world as of, as of pre-COVID-19 levels? Um, what we had to do was model out, because the, the EIA doesn't have, the, doesn't have real-time data on how much oil is being turned into gasoline, into diesel, and into jet fuel. So we had to model this based on historic trends over the last two or three years in regions around the world. And what you'll see is that, that we, we came up with out of nearly 101 million barrels a day of total crude oil that was being produced just prior to the COVID-19 um, downturn, 26.7 million barrels a day was going into gasoline, 28.8 million barrels a day going into diesel, and 7.3, 7.4 million barrels a day going into jet fuel. We know that almost all of gasoline goes into individual passenger cars. So individual transportation, we'll use most of that number based on our models. We obviously know that jet fuel goes into jet transportation. Uh, the, the question is how much diesel goes into individual passenger transportation. It's very little in the United States and most countries. It's a higher percentage in Europe, but we'll work through those models here in a minute to come up with the total amount of gasoline and diesel that's used for individual transportation. First, jet fuel. Of those 7.4 million barrels from sources like The Economist and others, we've gotten a lot of different ratios of how much jet fuel demand has dropped around the world. As we ran averages from all the different numbers that people are reporting, 70% drop in jet fuel demand right now, which correlates to a 5.2 million barrel a day drop just in jet fuel. That's the easy portion of the numbers that we're going to look at today. Let's now jump into the, the more hard, the more complex side. How do we know how much demand drop we see in individual driving? First of all, we looked at the number of uh, the amount of energy historically that gets converted from oil and fuel into individual transport and used that to identify what portion of gasoline and jet fuel, oops, bear with me just a second.
what portion of gasoline and jet fuel gets converted into individual transport of the 55 million barrels a day going total into transport some of that's gasoline some of that's diesel 30 million barrels a day that's combining gasoline and diesel goes into light or individual passenger car transportation so between the 7 million barrels of jet fuel 30 million barrels of gasoline and diesel for individual passenger cars that's the largest sources that are being or seeing demand destruction in today now the question is how much do people normally drive so the next thing we did was the next thing i did was look at average commute times around most of the dominant nations in the world where we have most of the cars and total amount of of miles driven per car and if you can't see this that's Six, 6,600 6, miles per day per car in the world, averaged out amongst most of the major uh, car consumers in the world. Um, and so when we look at the total amount of, of the, the average commute per area and the total amount of cars, total amount of mileage per car per area, we're pulling all that together to get a model of the total amount of, uh, total amount of miles driven by the average driver in the world. Then looking at the total number of cars in each, in each country in the world, we can extrapolate average total amount of daily commute per car in the world at 7.6 miles per day. That's the average commute per car in the world. And we pull all that together in our total analysis. So I looked at three, three, three different groupings. First, the United States, second, China, and then three, the rest of the world. I looked at the total number of cars average number of miles driven per year, and then the average number of miles driven per day over the number of people. You can look at all these various numbers, uh, total commute time to figure out when I, when I overlay the number of people who are sheltered in place today as a ratio of total population, I now know the number of people who are not driving to work every day. Now here's one of, our, here's one of my big assumptions. I assumed that the, that the ratio of people who are sheltered in place is equal to the ratio of people who are no longer driving to work. I will say that's a conservative assumption. In other words, that's a minimum. What we find is that actually most of the people who are sheltered in place in the world are in the major urban areas, which is also where most of the, uh, most of the driving is done for work every day. So this is a lower limit when I look, when I treat the ratios equivalent across the world. And my test was, looking at the United States and its gasoline demand, and also looking at China and its gasoline demand. So when I, figured, when I determined that there's been a 64% reduction in work driving in the United States, determined that there's been a 56% reduction in work driving in China, and looked around the world, there's been a 33% reduction in work driving around the world. Here comes the second assumption. When you look historically, work driving levels and other driving levels ratio up and down at virtually the same rate, unadjusted for seasonal, seasonal issues. But since this is not a seasonal issue, it's a global issue, we can assume that whatever amount work driving is dropping also is, is, is non-work driving dropping. So that 33% calculated from all those metrics is where I got this 33% number in, our, in my model for the total amount of driving that's, that's now off the market. So between 33% of total driving down in the world and the 70% of jet fuel that's down in the world, we have a total consumption today of 86 million barrels a day, which I opened with. At uh, a total, I already talked about this, at a total production level of 104 million barrels a day, that's where you get the 18 million barrels a day oversupply. Now the big question after all this is, well, Ryan, uh, where does this go from here? At what point do we, do, do we see recovery? What I did was I took some economic history based on data from the National Bureau of Economic Research to understand when we have rapid contractions in our economy, then how quickly does our economy recover? And in particular, in this instance, we're, seeing, we're gonna see two aspects of this downturn. We're gonna see the people who have a job today who currently are not driving to work because they're, they're staying at home or they're sheltered in place. So we can assume that as soon as the, the stay in place orders are lifted, they, have, they will immediately go back to work and therefore that demand returns immediately. However, everyone who has been laid off during this downturn, uh, they will not return to work immediately. They will take some time before they get their jobs back. So I'm combining for the sake of my projections, 
the short-term demand that returns when people who have their jobs go back to work, and then the long-term recovery as people get their jobs back. So we modeled this out. I modeled this out for a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, and 120-day shelter in place. Right now in the United States, the president just issued a couple days ago a new, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna shelter in place or, or uh, stay at home order through the rest of this month. So that's a 30-day, uh, that, that would feed into our 30-day model. If at the end of that, we announce there's gonna be another month, well, what does that mean in terms of demand return for oil? And so I modeled, as I said, a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, and 120-day uh, projection, depending on how long the, the world averages staying at home. This graph shows the demand projections. This line here, this top line was the trend before COVID-19. So if we just simply stayed the course, no COVID-19, we were seeing a little bit of a dip here at the beginning of the year. And then after that, demand was gonna to begin to grow again at, a, at a roughly a one half, between one half and 1% per year rate. Obviously with the COVID-19 reaction, we're seeing a massive demand destruction. And these various lines represent uh, how, how the, the market, I expect it to react based on how long we're sheltered in place. If the 30 days, so this is today, if after the 30 days, we get around the world, the orders lift and everybody goes back to work, that between the immediate recovery and then the slow economic recovery, we see, we see back to our original trend line demand occurring by August of this year, August of 20. If it's a 60 day, downturn, 60 day shelter in place, then we would return back to our markets, our, our, our normal trends. This is March of 21. If we see a 90 day, then it's November of 21. And if we see a 120 day world shelter in place, then this is June of 22 i.e. greater than two years away by the time after 120 days that demand recovers to its pre-COVID-19 levels. Now the question is, what does this mean for markets? Well, the world can't stay as oversupplied as it is today for very long because we'll fill up all the storage. And so if in 72 days nothing else has been done, you'll see world production slam shut to balance immediate consumption. What this tells us is, well, pricing will only stabilize when demand and or, or when supply and consumption become into balance. And so if my graphs or if my hurricane chart, if you will, is accurate, then you could, we could look in here and say, at what point does, at what point does the does, does supply begin to come off? And as we can model out going into the future, uh, it, these are the points at which depending on supply coming down, we'll see balance in the market. So we'll continue to monitor this. And these models are obviously, um, the, the, the former models were based on a lot of data we're getting about shelter in place, historic data about how much people drive, commute times, all those sort of things. This is based on a lot of historic economic models and then projecting those based on our current situation, which is admittedly unique. We've never seen this before. But I wanted to give folks an idea of what is the industry looking at in terms of reaction times and when will the market or demands come back based on just historic economic models. The one thing I will say that while some of these might be, some may argue this is conservative or aggressive in terms of this, this, these numbers, I would say the one thing that gives me hope that these, these demand numbers may come back faster than prior economic history is not just the speed with which we're seeing the decline, but also the ambition with which uh, people around the world seem to be reacting. So you're hearing a lot of people anxious to, we know this is a risk. We know we have to do things to stave off uh, the COVID-19 spread, but also very ambitious about getting back to work uh, about, about what we're gonna do on the back side of this. So I think if people uh, as, as, a, as a globe and as a country, if we stay uh, committed to that, that we're gonna, man, we're gonna pull out of this quickly and everyone's gonna get back to doing their, their thing, then these graphs could come much, much, much quicker. Uh, I'll close there. Those are the two pieces of data I wanted to give you to, to sum back up. The, the, the world today is we're having 18 million barrel a day oversupply. Uh, depending on what happens with supply, supplies coming back into balance, then that will, of course, uh, change how long we have to store. It also change market prices. 
And then depending on how long we stay, you know, stay at, stay at home and how much economic destruction we see beyond just oil and gas demand will certainly have a big impact on how quickly oil markets come back. With that, I'll take questions. Um, I'm going to go to my phone. This is where, I'll, where the questions will be coming up, um, and I'll answer them as they come in. Okay, from Ethan Bellamy, uh, where does your 1.3 billion barrels of available storage estimate come from? I've seen estimates from 900 million to 1.5 billion. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, we are we do see a lot of a lot of ranges today. Uh, we're pulling this from a, from a couple of different sources. We're looking at some EIA data, some IEA data, and we're also looking at some other models. People are are, um, have been running and then seeing where trends go. So we've kind of added, added all that up to come up with the 1.3 billion, which we, that's the number we feel confident in based on everything we've seen. Uh, Brian Litsky asks, what do you think will happen when storage fills in 72 days? Does the entire oil infrastructure, pipelines, wellhead come to a halt? What implications does this have on or for resilience to bring it back or will the system get clogged and need to be purged? Technically, what is worst case scenario? Thank you, Brian. I think actually this kind of speaks to some of the, the worst case scenario. Uh, I'll say this, and I've been a big proponent of us having forward looking discussions, not just in the state of Texas, but nationally and internationally about trying to bring stability to oil markets to avoid the, the slam shut that would happen in 72 days and try to get to more thoughtful, how can, we, how can we balance things so that there is a thoughtful or a strategic ramp down so that we don't hit that scenario. But yes, if nothing happens, it, then, what'll hap then, then what will happen is people who don't have access to, to storage, so the people who have existing storage access or contracts, whatever, they will, they will have preferential or they will have an advantage. People who don't, they'll just shut their wells in. And that could cause a lot of issues with employers, with businesses who go from some revenue stream to zero very, very quickly, uh, could cause some infrastructure issues because in certain regions now who don't have access to storage, those, those midstream facilities uh, have no way to, to source revenue or not fulfilling contracts. So I think the worst case scenario is that it brings, a, it brings an even higher degree of economic pain to the companies who are on the, the worst side of that. And overall, I think that will, in the long run, bring a lot of strain to the industry because of a, of a disproportionately um, harsh impact to so a pretty big portion of the industry. Um, the other part of your question was technically, what is the worst case scenario? I think the worst case scenario is this that let's suppose that with all of this demand destruction, wherever, wherever we end up landing in my model here, that, um, that, that the ability to supply the market is impacted. So I don't have supply on this graph anywhere, but let me, let me try to overlay that here. And I'm gonna get, I'm gonna try something, bear with me. Let's suppose that supply today is up here, and we're hoping that's going to come into balance. But but let's suppose that that without any planning, that there's a lot of pretty bad impacts, and oil oil producers, oil companies are really straining. Independents are suffering bankruptcies, massive layoffs, and so the ability—it's not just current supply, but the ability to produce comes down. And then somewhere in here, you know, we start to bounce back, and the market now demands much a pretty aggressive growth in oil consumption but the oil industry can't fill it. And so on the back end now, you, they start to try and fill it, but you see a big disparity between where there's, where there's undersupply. I actually think the worst case scenario is where you see something like a three to 4% or more undersupply. Historically, this has driven oil prices really high. When you look back and we had, I think in history, $137 or $147 a barrel at one point in 2008, I believe it was the market was only speculated to be undersupplied by 3%. So if we start running into this scenario, the massive, un, the massive price increases, cost for gasoline in the middle of an attempt at an economic recovery would, would be really, really difficult. And it would not only be hard for every consumer out there, it also put a lot of strain on the oil industry. Because now, you know, we, the, the oil industry tends to kind of, kind of catch blame for high prices, even though sometimes it's driven just by pure supply and demand. So that's what I believe would be the worst case scenario. Okay, uh, 
We track these, a lot of them are coming in. Uh, Bruce Fullen from Argus Media. Will the Texas Railroad Commission put a curtailment program in place? What will need to occur for that to happen? How soon will that happen? Could you comment on the other commissioners' views on proration? Well, you know, this has been a, the, the landscape around us is changing a real time, right? And uh, as probably most people on here know, I, I put out a, a statement saying, hey, we need to be talking about proration. It was just a couple of weeks ago. And since then, there's been a lot of conversation. Both the other commissioners, uh, I, I know Chairman Christian has put out a statement saying, look, he, like me, we, we're both free market guys. We don't like the idea of government involvement. At the same time, these are extraordinary times. And we want to listen to uh, whatever ideas are out there. We got a request uh, just Monday from producers to hold a meeting, a market evaluation meeting basically, to consider proration. What we're going to do, it looks like, is have an open meeting to discuss proration. Right now, we are, we are working towards April 14th. Now, on April 14th, we'll have a, an open meeting in which we can take uh, opinions, feedback, input from everybody. And this would be producers who think it's a great idea, producers who think it's a terrible idea, economists, academics, statisticians. Uh, the idea is to allow us to gather data that we can use to figure out, one, how might proration be done? Or one, is it a good idea? Two, how might it be done? And three, how might it be used to, to drive an international agreement, uh, an international movement to stabilize oil markets? So all of that will be considered April 14th. If the, the commission industry, if overall we come up with a recipe that we think looks good, in theory, we could act on that fairly quickly. And we have another conference meeting April 21st, where in theory, we could, as soon as that date, we could, we could take votes on something like this. But that would be the soonest. There's a lot of work to be done. We're, we're working with our staff right now to figure out how might this be affected. And so we'll have that, that discussion, hopefully on April 14th, to help, help us gather a lot of information. Uh, okay. Pete Morrow asks, you mentioned world storage. What is America's oil capacity and how many days before that is full? It's a good question, Pete. I think the latest data I've seen is it's around 300 million barrels in the United States. That does not include the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So between the, but you add that in, that's 50 to 70 million barrels of additional storage. And so call it somewhere between probably 300 and 350, 360 million barrels that they have storage left in the United States. How quickly that fills up depends on how much overseas crude is purchased. A lot of U.S. storage has filled up as, as oil marketers and, and oil transactors have tried to fill up oil storage with, um, with cheap crude that was on the market. Uh, as that begins to wane a little bit, that may give us more time. Right now, U.S. oil storage, when you look at the entire unit, U.S. is actually slated to fill up in around this same time period. So it's not a whole lot sooner or later. But once again, that depends a lot on where people buy crude from. So it's hard to, it's hard to speculate on just the United States. Uh, Brian Litsky asks again, does the Texas Railroad Commission have authority to shut in Texas oil production at the wellhead? only if we prorate like 100%. Uh, so, so no, really our authority is to set a proration schedule that has historically been done on a lease level. Uh, and we're talking today, one of the conversations is, how might that be, be done today? Might it be done at a producer level, for example? And so there's a lot of consideration to be done, but, but no, I don't believe, I should say, that we have authority other than enforcement issues. But from, a, from, a, um, from an operation standpoint, the Railroad Commission can't, I don't believe we have the authority to pick and choose wells to shut down, if that's what you're asking. Uh, Jessica, Coro, Je Jessica Corso asks, will the Railroad Commission hold a hearing on operation cuts? When? I just answered that. Derek Brower asks, have you made progress in securing agreement from Texas producers to curtail production? I think I just answered that question. Uh, Marcelo, forgive me, Lapria Bigot asks, are you sending the link to watch the presentation? I would like to share it with my students at Texas A&M. Thanks for the excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, we will make this public in some form or fashion, and these graphs, we'll be sending them out uh, to the public to consume as well. So yes, we'll hopefully have this available for people to view. Uh, John Olson, on the rebound, you have people working at home who start commuting again. Why does that rebound get smaller for the longer shelter in place time periods? Are you assuming more get laid off with longer shelter in place periods? Short answer is, you look in our graph, yes, that, that we're assuming more people get laid off. In other words, that sort of economic demand or economic destruction that happens the longer we shelter in place, 
uh, the, the more economic erosion we have. And so, yes, you have more people laid off and it takes longer for those people to come back to work. Uh, Bruce asks, Bruce Fallen again, additional questions. Please update us with your recent interactions with the Saudis. As of today, I've had no formal interaction with the Saudis. There has been a lot of intermediaries uh, who have been communicating with me and letting me know about kind of what they're doing. And I think trying to create opportunities for conversation, but we've had no formal uh, interaction. Yesterday, this is again from Bruce, Argus Media reported crude prices Dollar per barrel, WTI at $15.57 a barrel with Midland at $13.69 for May. How much lower do you expect crude prices to fall? I'm going to say it. Uh, I have had some producers tell me that they're beginning to get offers at $6 a barrel in the Permian. Now, that's net to the producer. That's after, the, that's after di di differentials and after transportation costs. But um, we're seeing some very low prices, uh, and that's in the Permian. We're, I'm hearing uh, anecdotally that in places like Canada, Western Canadian Select is basically trading for zero. In other words, there's no, there's no price for heavy sour in some parts of the world. And once again, that's not an overall economic number. These are just anecdotal numbers that I'm hearing. Uh, Ethan Bellamy asks, have you done any preliminary work about how you would execute technically the proration? Does the Railroad Commission have the personnel, software, and bandwidth to execute such a program? I believe that we do. At the end of the day, the Railroad Commission has good data. We get production reports from industry uh, monthly. And so uh, we have the ability, just like I've done in this spreadsheet, to pull data together and to, to build proration schedules. We just have to determine what's the right mechanism for both an economic and a producer standpoint to do it. Um, our, our, our agency, the Railroad Commission, has a lot of very smart people who really understand the market. So I believe whatever is the right thing for Texas, uh, our, our staff, we can make it happen. Uh, Will Shen asks, you said your recovery projections are based on historic patterns, but everything we hear leads to the virus hanging around for quite a bit. Unless there is a vaccine, do you have a recovery of demand graph under that scenario? Good question, Will, and I'll say that this recovery model I've come up with is, is, is somewhat simplified. In other words, I was trying to give a, what, what are the bounds here uh, give us an idea of what we're looking at. If, uh, if we wanted to go into a lot of detail, what we, what we really would do is start to model these based on individual portions of the global economy. For example, China and the United States being the biggest economies, is their reaction time, for example, different than other slower portions of global economy? I haven't done that. So no to answer your question, I don't have a model based on some, based on a uh, a, a something triggering a big change. This is based purely on how long we, as a as a globe, on average, shelter in place. And so there's a lot of a lot of scrutiny we can place to, to say, oh well, Ryan's model was conservative because you know some of these curves are going to going to react more quickly. Ryan's Ryan's uh, graph was not conservative. That there are things that can happen even longer that may make it go go longer. Daniel Barrera asks, what assumptions are being made to generate the recovery curve? As I said, when I looked at data from the National, um, the National Bureau of Economic Research, there was some really interesting data on, on when contractions happen and how quickly the recoveries happen. So what I did is I pulled all these historic, I think they had something like 80 of them over the last like 100 years. And they had demands, they had contractions and expansions during all those 80. And I, I looked at which ones were tied to certain issues in history. And I built different, different reaction times. In other words, how quickly does the contraction happen? And how quickly, what's the ratio of expansion time based on what happened in historical trends from National Bureau of Economic Research data. So you may question my, my the, the question may be, well, did I draw correct conclusions from the, from their data in terms of contractions and expansions? But in general, you look at historical trends, um, you know, when you look at things that cause those expansions and contractions, I felt like there were some that were closer to our scenario and some that were not. Uh, all right, the last one I've got here. What will, refine, what will refilling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve have on your model? Good question. Let's go back to... The conclusions I drew here, in the end, I say we've got an 18 million barrel per day oversupply. Strategic Petroleum Reserve, if it's, let's assume it's at, at the high side, we wanted to fill up 70 million barrels of Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That's four days of global supply. Now, that may mean longer for the United States. So one thing that may happen is if the United States stops buying overseas crudes, 
uh, and that we start to fill up the strategic petroleum reserve, one thing that could happen is that the timeline for the world gets shorter, or the timeline for the United States gets longer. And you will absolutely hear that some companies in the United States are pushing for that. So let's, the, the U.S. companies are saying, let's give the U.S. an advantage with our storage, give us a longer timeline to allow us to strategically ramp down. And so that's really where we're going to, where you'd see the biggest change is U.S. access to storage. Uh, John Glennon asks, are there any concerns about the long-term precedent a Texas oil production cut would have on the oil and gas industry? Will it send a signal to investors that Texas may take actions that interfere with companies in low price scenarios? Good question, John. Here, here's my statement on this. I think the answer is no. Uh, and, and forgive me for being a, a bit direct about this, but, but this is a question about, hey, is this, is this sending the message to the market that, that no longer is the oil business going to be a free market environment, that the Railroad Commission is not going to let that happen? I, I don't think that's the case. It, it, there's nothing about today's environment that says this is a free market. Uh, let's face it, the world oil price has been set by somebody for 90 years. It was set by OPEC for the last 40, and it was set by the Texas Railroad Commission to the 50 before that. And the environment we're in today with this demand destruction has nothing to do with the free market. I mean, if you believe that this is about the free market, then apparently the United States is 95% oversupplied with restaurants. But of course, we don't think that. We know that when you look at airline traffic, you look at restaurant traffic, this is all due to a, to a, a completely extraordinary condition. And so what's happening is state, local, regional, federal governments are trying to figure out how to do things to enable some continuity, some stability in all of these various industries so that we don't feel the pain on the back end. And so, so sure, I'm, I'm hesitant, right? I've got a, a, my, my free market antenna are up and I say, we want whatever we do if we do something. One needs to be aligned with an international movement to stabilize markets, but also how do we, un, how do we get out of it ASAP tied only to COVID-19 reaction so that the world can be confident that in general, we aren't in the market business. What we're in is, is trying to provide stability during, during arguably one of the most extraordinary times in our nation's history. I think if people know that, then they, this wouldn't give investors a lot of pause. Uh, Sergio Chapa asks, does this data support industry requests for proration or does it support opponents? You know, Sergio, that's a good question. And I, I can't tell you what this supports. I can just tell you this is the data. Now, I will say this is somebody already asked about what happens in the U.S. with storage. And I would say that if we start seeing that the U.S. storage is filling up disproportionately early, then some may use that as an argument and say, we gotta pro we're going to prorate one way or the other, they may say, either because storage is all full and, you know, proration happens because we all we slam a bunch of wells shut or Let's do it thoughtfully and try to bring some stability as we go down that road. I have heard people say that. One of the reasons I want to have this meeting April 14th is to see what people do with this data and then what they think that means, not just for proration, but for other actions that may happen both nationally and internationally. Uh, Kevin, sorry, I missed one. Uh, Zachary Mar Marchilden, Marchilden, forgive me, Zach Zachary, do you, do you believe that the supply cuts will have to happen naturally by the EMPs or will governments need to step in to regulate production volumes to get the levels needed based on your model? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, Zachary, to be blunt. Uh, it, I, I can't tell you today, exact, I do know a lot of producers are beginning to cut already. Uh, especially when you're hearing these really low wellhead prices, they're just, they're, they're shutting in wells and they're curtailing based on the economic environment. The challenge is a lot of what we're going to see is they're going to be laying down drilling rigs, which is where the biggest cost comes from. But that doesn't take oil off the market today. It takes oil off the market in three months and six months and a month from now. And that may be exactly when we want that oil back because that's when the market is beginning to that's exactly when the market is beginning to come back. So there is a question about whether or not, hey, I may have to do things today to, to balance my, my financials or to try to get them closer. And it really doesn't take a lot of oil off the market today, but it ends up taking oil off the market in six months, which is, which is out of whack because of this extreme short term down and up. So it's long as saying we're certainly going to see some reaction. From, from producers, and that will take some production offline. I just don't know if that's going to be enough to really bring stability. That's the discussion on April 14th. 
Uh, Tim Ferrito, have you taken a more micro look at various locations in the United States who have less ability to get into low global tankage? Likewise, have you looked at micro supply demand balances in the United States? Looking solely at global balances will be misleading for U.S. producers. I agree with you, Tim. You know, this is that my model back here is based on global numbers. And to your point, man, even if I just compared Cushing to Mont Bellevue, right, based on where refineries sit and their transportation, this is not the, the standard number for everywhere. So you you make a good point. No, I haven't done that yet, but we are looking at it. Prior to our April 14th discussion, in fact, hopefully in the next few days, I'll have more detailed information about what we see happening in various areas. Uh, but I thought I thought important to start at the global level because at the end of the day, to the average consumer not in the oil business who just says, I need to buy a gallon of gas, and I like that it's cheap today, but if super low prices today translate into four and five dollar a gallon gasoline in six months, then I, that, that's no good. We're, this, this more is speaking to the overall price of commodities for the average consumer. Adam Button asks, assume a 90 day shutdown. How much does global production need to fall? Is it realistic to expect a US Texas curtailment? I'll go back to my model here and I'm gonna preface this by saying that, look, this, this makes some pretty big assumptions about the amount of economic downturn that we've seen in the first two weeks of coronavirus and how much that continues. Now, my, 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 my personal economic studies, my economic models say, look, we're seeing a fairly, I don't say linear, but a fairly steep economic decline. And, and so we're seeing this, this really steep drop off. So if you ask in a 90 day shutdown, 90 day shelter in place, according to my model, global demand would get down to 75, sorry, would get down to somewhere below between 70 and 75 million barrels a day with a 90 day shutdown, a 90 day shelter in place. Uh, if that's the case, I think everyone in the world is going to curtail. Storage will be full, and you'll get to a point where the world will, will only be able to put out as much oil as it is consuming. So yes, you're talking about that point. The world will have to have shut in roughly 25% of its current production just to balance markets. And the United States will have to have, have to participate in that either due to market reaction by the businesses or due to government action. Uh, Eric ja Jansen asks, do you have any advice for someone who is graduating with a petroleum engineering degree right now? Yes, Eric, I do. Thank you for that question. Uh, look, I'll tell this to anybody in industry. I'll get a little philosophical for you for a minute, with you for a minute. One of the things that we miss sometimes in these types of downturns uh, is it's, and I, I felt it before. I've been through three of these in my time in industry, and it is, it is hard to look at this and say, man, uh, how, how do I get optimistic about opportunities? It, you'll look, even in my 120-day scenario, two years from now, the world is going to want the same amount of oil it was going to want whether or not we had COVID-19. And in fact, I'll even go a step further. This was the previous trend line. One thing that the world will want even more when we begin to react, get out of COVID-19 is affordable, reliable energy. And there is no energy source more, a lot, more reliable and more affordable than oil and natural gas. So you're going to see, I believe, eventually the demand even comes up higher and the world will want 102, 103, 104 million barrels a day at some point. Now, whether that's two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, the world's going to want it. And it's going to take a lot of technological development to get there. Here's what I would tell you, Eric, take this opportunity to expand your knowledge. And this is not just for folks graduating with a petroleum engineering degree. This is those of us who are in, in public policy or who run companies or who are, are work on staff, we're concerned about our jobs. What can I learn about the next technological advancements to produce more efficiently? Uh, how much are we hearing these days about use of data to impress? Hey, look at all this data I've just done to inform us. And I pulled publicly available data. Nothing I gathered up here was railroad commissioner specific. This was all stuff that you could find if you didn't have research from public sources, but pulling together data to model things. For example, how do you make a refinery more reliable using data? How do you make production costs come down? How do you prevent failures? I mean, using, there's tons of data out there. We've heard a lot about that over the last couple of years. Well, we're learning that. So taking the, the, the old school knowledge and the, the really key things we've needed in industry, and now you, now you taking this opportunity to learn and evolve is where we're gonna see big opportunities to participate in the future after we get past this two year downturn. But Eric, I will say this, my heart goes out to you because it, it's, I think the next couple of years are gonna be challenging. But, uh, but if you're just getting out of college now, you're gonna have a 
lot of your life to have a lot of, uh, to do a lot of great things in your oil business. Jennifer Zhu asks, will other states in the United States work with Texas to cut oil since it is a global issue? We don't know the answer to that yet, although we are starting to have connections uh, informally today with other states and hearing that other states are looking at this as well. So as of right now, I had no formal interaction, but expect that that will come because everyone in the world is looking at this as we look to stabilize uh, the markets in every in every pocket, every state and every nation, just like you said. In fact, one thing I'll comment on this, uh, you didn't ask Jennifer, but I'll, I'll, I'll take this approach, take this time to mention it. You know, one thing I think is telling right now is, while the federal government is you know, pushing out trillions of dollars in stimulus money all around the world, all around the country, I mean, to bring stability, you know, one thing about proration is it's not asking the government for money. In fact, one thing I was really disappointed in was that the federal government pulled funding for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, not because at the end of the day, $17 or $18, whatever they would have paid for that oil was gonna be great for the oil business. It provided a little bit more storage, but man, the, I do not believe for a second that the world can make 100 million barrels of oil for $30 a barrel or $40 a barrel, probably even for $50 a barrel. I think it takes 60. So the federal government could go in and buy oil, fill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and then triple their investment in a matter of a year or two when the market comes back. So it would require no, no money going to private business, no stimulus dollars. Instead, it would have been a fantastic investment that still would have brought some stability. So I was disappointed to see that taken out when it was such a great investment opportunity for the government. Henry Hoffman asks, it seems you are leaning towards proration. Then is it your opinion that Texas production is at the high end of cost curve and some of the first to shut in? It's our understanding that Texas shale uh, lift costs are lower than a lot of other global production. So why not just let the market sort itself out? Okay, Henry, good question. As I, I said a minute ago, let me try to be a little more prescriptive. This isn't about cost of production because we already drilled the wells, right? So yes, lift costs right now are fairly cheap. It's about where do you have storage available and what about what happens on the back end when the demand is there and, and the companies have gone bankrupt due to an artificially low revenue source. So if by flooding the market with crude, there's just and, and, and inventory is filling up and now there's a zero dollars, companies go bankrupt because of this very short artificial downturn. Once again, I'll use my, my restaurant example. Restaurant, do we, do we think that somehow restaurants are just all going to go belly up and that's okay because it's just the market? Well, when we start back to wanting more restaurants, how long is it take them to hire staff back and build out and re-sign leases? I mean, the, the time to get back takes a lot longer than it takes to close down. By trying to stave that off, we will, it'd be better for all of us in the long run. So it's not really just about cost. It's about overall stability of the supply chain, if you will. And the problem is that because Texas producers are all independents, whereas say Saudi, Russia, others have already national control, there's, a, there's less ability to strategically move all of those people at the same time. In fact, it's impossible for private business to do it in reaction to this extraordinary dis, uh, downturn. Joseph Allman says, by the way, I've got 12 more minutes. I'm gonna cut this off at, um, at, at three o'clock. So I'll answer the questions until then. Joseph Allman asks, hi Ryan, great presentation, thank you. Since Texas oil production is only quote unquote five plus million barrels per day, how impactful would Pro rationing be, and how would you phase out the program? Thank you, thank you, Joseph. Uh, by itself, Texas pro rating would have very little impact on global prices. So, if you ask me, Ryan, uh, looking at this over here, do you think to try to bring stability to the market, Texas should pro rate? No, because Texas pro rating will bring no stability to the market. Now. The one new nuance we're hearing today is, Ryan, if storage fills up just to Texas producers, we're going to see, we're going to see those cuts anyway. Should we consider it not from a market stability perspective internationally, but to bring some stability just in Texas supply chain? Maybe. That's what we're going to talk about on April 14th. I don't have an opinion for you on that today. But if you ask me, should Texas try to prorate today to bring stability to the global oil market? No, there's no point. But if it gives us the opportunity to drive conversations about leading in this area with, with OPEC, with Saudi Arabia, with the Russians, in this extraordinary time to bring balance to an industry that the whole world needs, I think now is the time to do that, at least to explore it. So not advocate for proration, but we at least need to talk about it. Uh, 
Michael McNamara says, would Texas act on proration independently? Wouldn't this subsidize other states to grow or keep production flat? Or would we act only if we had participation from other states and countries? Michael, I think I just answered that question that I think we do need, you know, we need, we need some collaboration with other people to make this meaningful, unless this is simply about controlling U.S. storage, uh, Texas storage filling up. Uh, from Mitchell Borden, what do you believe the Texas energy landscape will look like? Oh, sorry, what do you believe the energy landscape will look like in Texas, especially in the Permian Basin, if the U.S. doesn't get the spread of the coronavirus under the control by the summer? I'll go back to this graph, and this is a um, this is a graph of of yes world, but I think that this is would be just as stark in the Permian Basin. In other words, if I said, well, man, you know, twenty five percent of demand is going to come out of the market. Uh, then I think that's going to hit the Permian Basin, possibly even a little bit more, because when you get down into these low dollars, uh, the new shale producer, uh, sorry, these low demand levels at 75 million barrels a day, for example, at that level, the, the new shale well in, during a decline, the new shale well in, in Texas doesn't have good economics. Uh, really, where Texas is really advantaged is in new demand. So we start getting back up into this range, and the world says, I want more oil, then 95 million barrels a day, where do we get that new oil from? Man, we can get it out of Texas fast and we can get it te into Texas midstream fast. Therefore, we can put it into Texas refiners fast or the rest of the country. So unfortunately, if we have this delayed downturn, this is gonna hit Texas, I think, as hard as it is anywhere in terms of new capital developments. Uh, okay, uh, Adam Button says, Great stuff. Hope you do this again. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Trey Muir asks, does the proration decision require unanimous approval from all three commissioners or two out of three? It's a good question. Nobody's asked that. I, it only takes two out of three commissioners. We're a, we're a board and a majority vote wins, so two-thirds would, would, would swing the day. Uh, Dion Doherty says, what is the leading idea for curtailment? Reduce a percentage of each producer's volume, set a quota by lease. Right now, there isn't a leading idea. Historically, it was all done by lease. If you go from the 1920s to the early 1970s, we had a lease-based proration schedule at the Railroad Commission. But uh, I believe now is a great time to think about what are other mechanisms we could use, not just where we set the proration schedule, but how do we offer other flexibility out there? You know, people who are hedged, for example, might they want to buy other people's proration production? So there's gonna be a lot of discussion about that to offer some market flexibility. If we go down this road, and I wanna make sure everyone's clear on this, we've decided nothing. We're, I'm not advocating for anything other than having the conversation to figure out what opportunities, what options do we have? And if, if there is something we need to do, what mechanism might we use? Uh, Jamie Weisenberger asks, will any further incentives be offered to operators during this down market? That's a good question. I don't know of any today. Danny Pena asks, if we turned all foreign oil around, what would that look like for our market in the United States? Danny, that's a good question. And, and if I looked historically up to about, um, if you look at U.S. refining runs, you say, well, the U.S. refines roughly, let's call it 18 to 19 million barrels a day of crude oil. Now, a lot of that is turned around and exported right back out. We, we're exporting of our refined products about four to five million barrels a day. I mean, we're, we get that, that's not a, not a, that tends to kind of fall into the backlight, but our, our refiners are the leading refined products suppliers in the world. But they're importing a lot of crude, especially heavy sour crude or, or heavy crudes to blend with the light sweet crudes coming out of the Permian Basin. I think but I, I, gotta, I think we import roughly, if you use, well, the United States was producing 12 million barrels a day. So we're importing 6 million barrels a day, roughly. Uh, let's call it 5 to 6 million barrels a day of crude that's coming in the United States from all over the world. A lot, most is coming from Canada uh, and Mexico. But then we're pulling from everywhere. It's a, it's, a, it's a buyer's market. It has been for a little while. And so I think if you say we're shut all that down, it certainly would make, if you shut down all imports, it would drive the price of U.S. crudes to the roof. The problem is, most of our more sophisticated refiners can't run just Texas light sweet. You have to have the heavier crudes to blend with it to make it efficient to run those plants. So th there is, I don't believe there's any scenario where we would say we wouldn't import, import any crude, but there have been some questions about what if we only imported from certain areas, say allies, for example, you're hearing some of that, but what if we just pulled in from say Mexico and Canada and a few others uh, to try to, um, 
to try to make the blend we need, but still help out the U.S. crude producer. I don't have any any reason to believe that that's in the works or happening, but you'll hear some of that commentary. Uh, Matt Most, the Wall Street Journal editorial board prefer, referred to proration as a particularly bad idea. How are they wrong? Well, look, I'll go back to the idea that in the end, um, do you think that uh, do you think that the things the government is trying to do to stabilize markets in in uh, in, in schools, for example, right, where there's, there's school teachers now shifting their focus away and people being educated from home. Do you think that what they're doing in restaurants, you know, what they're doing in, uh, in, in the airline industry, those are all bad ideas? Look, they, I'm, not, I'm not saying Parish is what we should do today, but to prejudge a conversation we haven't even had, frankly, I find is arrogant. I'm surprised that, that, that people are out there prejudging this given the extraordinary circumstances without at least having a conversation about what would this mean? What are the pluses and minuses? So, uh, you know, I, my sense is until we've heard from people what are the possible mechanisms and while other industries are asking for government pay, bailouts, why wouldn't we at least consider some mechanisms to stabilize? Uh, Michael McNamara says, do you think that the Saudi slash Russia price war will be resolved this year, mid next year or later? Do we need the U.S. to play a part in accelerating this? Well, that's the first thing last. I think the U.S. does need to play a part. Clearly, there's a lot of international positioning. Um, there's a lot of opportunist uh, you know, st strategy going on here, which normally speaking, I'd say good for them. If we were in normal market conditions, Russians, Saudis, the United States competing in the oil business, great, that we can have friendly competition. But, but now is the time to think about the sort of global good, right? If we end up in a situation where we can't supply the world's oil demand in a few months or a year, that's gonna be so detrimental that nobody in the oil business will look good. And so uh, now's the time for us to step up and to lead and to drive those conversations and to drive a kind of, think about what's in the, in the global economic good. And I think that, frankly, I think that people will be receptive to that in other places, but the U.S. is going to have to, to, to take a leadership role, which I think we're already doing, even with these kind of conversations. Um, the thing I'll say is you ask, when do I think this gets resolved? Well, if it doesn't get, it's going to resolve itself one way or the other. By in the next by, by mid June, if nothing happens, the world's storage will be filled, and then then it will be resolved because there won't be anywhere to put the oil, and so they're going to have to figure out who owns the storage and who just has to shut in production. So, so one way or the other, everyone's going to cut. It's just a question of whether it's in a planned way or in a reactive way. Uh, okay. Uh, Joseph Allman asks again. I got three more minutes. I'll try to get these last three. Wall Street Journal, oh, sorry, the, thanks again, Ryan. How would you phase out the proration program? I don't have a, 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 a formal answer this yet, but I have had some thoughts. One would be that we only keep proration in place as long as there is nat national disasters, regional disasters, which are declared by presidents and governors in place in response to COVID-19. So once one mechanism, maybe once those disaster declarations are lifted, then maybe our proration lifts. At that point, you know, US, Texas supplies would be down lower, and so it would take some time to react anyway. But, but tying it to something like a national disaster means that we, we set a precedent that we don't just do this when prices are low. It has to be in some sort of artificial market condition. But we'll work through that as we work toward April 14th. Uh, Mose Michelli says, could proration in Texas slash U.S. help stabilize price without concurrent international commitments to lower production? What role does the federal government have in getting those commitments? Uh, thank you, Mose. I think I answered this already. Frankly, Texas is doing something in a vacuum. I don't think does anything. It's, a, it's symbolic, nothing else. But it does, I think, show that we're bringing consideration, our leadership to the table, so that as the president, federal government, guys like myself are trying to work with people in other states and other nations, it shows that we are seriously thinking and that we're leading on this. I think from that perspective, it adds value to the national and international um, talks. Last question. Michael Sarasoli, forgive me if I butcher that, Michael. Any higher level thoughts on natural gas? I will. It's a good one to end on. Michael, uh, I'll tell you this right now. Um, if, if, I was a, if, I had to, if I had to invest some money today in oil and natural gas, I'd tell you, boy, both. <laughs> I am not an investment guy. I do not have my series whatever you have to have to get investment advice. Let me, I wish I could print a big, big exclaimer across top says, do not take anything I'm saying as investment advice. That said, natural gas is what, $1.60 and change per MMBTU. Um, you know, you're gonna start to see some associated gas 
come off the market right now uh, due to the, a lot of you know, oil production being shut in. And it, whereas oil production has dropped, you know, 15% or sorry, oil demand has dropped 15% over the first few days or first couple weeks of coronavirus. Energy consumption has dropped, but not, I mean, electricity consumption has dropped, but not near as much. So what you're finding is in general, the world's electricity consumption is going to remain relatively steady. So I think that the natural gas prices are the, the natural gas markets actually probably have more quick upturn in them than the oil markets do, but the oil markets are so depressed right now that they make that between the two of them, it's hard to, hard to figure out which one's a better investment opportunity. Go out here. The world is going to want affordable, reliable energy. The world energy demand has gone up every single year since 1950 or in a couple of years actually stayed flat, but it's basically gone up every year. And if you look, the proportion of that energy that comes from oil and natural gas has actually gone up, not down. Now, granted, coal has shrunk, so it's made room for those other two, but the world's going to want these products. The question is, how do you weather this storm to come out on the back end and be able to supply the world's demand? And those who are able to weather this storm, I think, are going to be in a good position. All right, that's an hour. I know, by the way, I talk really fast. You, everyone was really patient. Thank you. Thank you for all the fantastic questions. We are going to make this available, uh, both the presentation and hopefully the graphs. We'll get those out there so people can watch these. Uh, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to send them to me, uh, either at our, either our official Railroad Commission uh, website and my email address there. Get them into us. We'll try to answer them. And we will. I'll try to keep doing this to provide updates as we go forward. Uh, thank you, all of you in the oil biz, energy business. Uh, while this is certainly about energy, it's also about the, the global good right now. The, the world, as we react to this and try to pull together, access to affordable, reliable energy is one of the fundamental pieces of our economy. I mean, next to food, shelter, I mean, this is it. And so um, for all of us who are in this business, we're going to play a key role in the recovery. And I sure appreciate everything that you do. Thanks for spending time with me today. Ryan sitting out.